Can you use GPS for everything? We certainly get used to doing so a lot, especially with advanced avionics like the G1000 here. We're on top of a thick layer going into Atlantic City, New Jersey. We've been told to expect the VOR approach into runway 31 from Smits, which is the initial approach fix closest to our arrival from the north. Now, we're able to load the approach into our GPS, even though it's a VOR approach, and it'll guide us all the way down to minimums. What does the FAA have to say about using our GPS for a ground-based VOR approach? AIM 1-2-3 deals with this. Note 5 down here says use of a suitable RNAV system, meaning GPS, as a means to navigate the final approach segment of an instrument approach procedure based on a VOR is allowable. Then it says the underlying NAVID, in this case the Atlantic City Vortac, must be operational and it must be monitored for the final segment course alignment. So at a bare minimum, we have to, quote, monitor the Atlantic City Vortac on just the final approach segment, which here is from the Burger intersection to the missed approach point, Zucker. We're going to turn it on out here, though, to make sure everything's okay. Now, you can switch from GPS to VLOC mode to get the so-called raw data from the VOR on the green needles, but then we lose the precise guidance the GPS offers. Another option is to keep the GPS guidance on the magenta needles and just monitor the VOR. First, let's make sure we have the frequencies tuned in. Typically, the G1000 will auto-load in the primary nav aid onto nav 1 when we load the approach, and there it is, 117.15. The CIL VOR is on nav 2, but we don't need this for the approach. We're going back to Smith's on the missed approach for the hold, which is 11 DME on the 090 radial from Atlantic City. We could also identify Smith's on the 178 radial from the coil vortex, but we don't need that. We'll push the PFD option soft key on the bezel for the PFD. Then we'll push bearing 1. This brings up a thin arrow that points the direction toward the VOR. Think of this like the old ADF if you ever used one. It simply points the direction off your nose where the station is. The tail of the arrow indicates what radial you're on. Here we're crossing over the 060 radial. If we hit the bearing 2 soft key we get another arrow. It's also pointing at the nav 1 station which is Atlantic City. If we push it again, it switches to nav 2, which is on C aisle. We'll get rid of that. We also need DME to shoot this approach, as it is a DME arc beginning at Smith's. We'll push the DME soft key, and the DME distance from nav 1 comes up. Smith's will be at 11 DME, and we'll want to stay on that distance on the DME arc until intercepting the approach course at 302 degrees. When we're cleared for the approach, we can activate it on the GPS. Because we were already navigating to Smith's, there's no change in course. We'll start our descent down to 2000. The GPS will fly the entirety of the DME arc on the approach course. We'll manage altitude since this is a non-precision approach with not even an advisory vertical guidance. Smith's is on the 090 radial 11 DME, so we'll look for where the tail of the thin arrow gets to 090 or due east. Also, we're looking for 11 DME. When we get there, the turn onto the arc begins. Now when we learn DME arcs, we sometimes practice the turn 10, twist 10 technique, making a series of 10 degree turns, effectively turning the procedure into a 36 sided polygon. The GPS is more precise and makes a very shallow, steady turn that keeps us 11 miles from the station. Makes DME arcs a lot easier, right? The approach course is on the 122 radial, a course of 302 degrees. When the head of the arrow approaches 302, we'll know we're getting close. It's around that point, maybe about a half mile prior, when we'll make our big right turn inbound. When we're established inbound, we can descend to 1500 feet. The thin arrow should now be pointed straight ahead at our approach course of 302. Even if there was a crosswind we were compensating for, the arrow would be skewed right or left, but it would still be pointing at 302 since the directional card moves along with the arrow. Let's say we want to use the green needles instead of the more passive thin bearing needle. Anytime we fool around with the guidance, let's first set the autopilot to follow the heading bug so we don't have an unwanted turn. Then we'll push the CDI soft key to move over to green needles. We need to set our OBS course to the desired inbound of 302, so we twist the OBS course knob until we read 302. Since we're already on it, the needle should center there. Now we can go back to following the guidance, this time of the VOR, by pushing the nav button on the autopilot. About a half mile from the final approach fix, we configure the approach and start down, getting the handoff to tower and our landing clearance. Technically, this is the only part of the approach where we actually need to be monitoring the VOR, 
but of course it's safer to start further out. We level off at 500, just above the MDA, and we get to 1.9 DME, which is the visual descent point. We don't have the runway in sight, but in our slow Cessna with a 10,000 foot runway, we can push it a bit further. This is the kind of thing we should add in our briefing, where to decide to go missed. It doesn't have to be at the VDP. Indeed, we pick up the runway at 1.6 DME, still 0.8 miles from the missed approach point, which is 0.8 DME. So we can go below MDA and descend to land. It'll be a bit higher, of course, because we stayed at MDA past the VDP, but again, we have 10,000 feet of runway to work with. All in all, this doesn't really feel much different than a non-precision LNAV approach, since we use the GPS for most of the procedure, just with the added caveat that we need to at least have the VOR monitored at the same time. And for full IFR ground school, check out Flight Insight today at the link here and in the description.